This is the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Thank you so much for tuning into this video on semi primes and cryptography. So let's first go through semi prime numbers. So these are numbers that have exactly three or exactly four factors. It means you can write them as the product of two primes. So what does this mean? Well, let's look at some examples. So for example, the number 14 is a semi prime. This is because it can be written as seven times two. It can be written as a prime number times a prime number. So if I were to find the factors of 14, it would be one, two, seven, and 14. This has exactly four factors. So another example of a semi-prime is 25. That's a semi-prime. It can be written as five times five, as prime number times prime number. So if I were to look at the factors of 25, it's just 1, 5, and 25. It has exactly three factors and therefore is semi-prime. So examples of numbers that are not semi-prime. So 20 is an example of a number that's not semi-prime. So if I were to write 20 as the product of primes, it's 2 times 2 times 5. I need to have three prime numbers multiplied together to get 20. If I were to write the factors of 20, well, there's actually quite a few. I have 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20. So because it has six factors, it has too many factors, it is not a semi-prime number. So another example of something that's not a semi-prime, 37 is a normal prime number. It has only two factors, 1 and 37. That's why it's prime. 1 is not a prime number. So I can't write 37 as a prime times another prime. So if a number is prime, it is not semi-prime. So semi-prime numbers are used extensively in cryptography. So cryptography is where we're going to use some maths to take a message that we want secret, encode it, so that someone else can decipher that message and anyone who intercepts it can not. So that's what we're going to look for on the next slide. So let's have a brief overview of how cryptography works. So let's say my friend wants to send me a message, but we want the message to be secret. What will have to happen is my friend will have to encode the message. My friend will take the message and turn it into gibberish. They do this so that if my enemy intercepts the message, they have no idea what the message says. But here's what makes it complicated. We want the message to be easy enough for me to decode, but not easy for my enemy to decode. Now, it's all well and good if you were, say, passing a note in class. Like, your friend passes you a note so that you understand what it says, but you don't want anyone else in the class to understand what it says. But in this day and age, often the friends, the people we're communicating with, are not people we know. For example, the friend might be my bank, and they might be sending me information about my bank account, like when I log on to internet banking. So I want the message to be clear. I want to be able to see how much money is in my account. But if there's a hacker out there and they hack into my bank account, I don't want them to be able to see how much money is in my account or to be able to send money to themselves. So that's where this gets a little complicated. So what will have to happen is I will have to have some sort of information that my enemy doesn't have. And we call this information a key, or more specifically, a private key. So to be able to send message to lots of different computers, there's also a public key. So there's a key that everyone has, but then there's also a key that only I have. So you can sort of think of it like a double locked door. Everyone has the key to the first keyhole, but only I have a key to the second keyhole. So what has this got to do with maths? Well, what we want to do is we want to come up with a way where we can, I can decode the message easily, but my enemy can't. 
So what we end up doing is we need to find operations in maths that are easy to perform one way, but really hard to perform the other way. And it turns out those operations are multiplying and factorization. So what this is based on is that when I'm decoding the message, because of the information in my private key, my computer only needs to multiply together two numbers. Whereas if we don't have that information, like the enemy, we actually need to factorize. And that's very hard to do. So in reality, you're dealing with numbers that have hundreds of digits. They are hard to factorize. There's no quick way to do it. So we're going to look at an example of a message. We will encode it and then decode it. So what we're going to do is take the message, I love soccer, because let's be honest, soccer is the best sport. And we're going to encode it. So the public key that everyone has access to is going to be a number, this time 437. This number, it turns out, is a semi-prime number. It is the product of two prime numbers. The reason we use that is because they're hard to factorize. 437 is not an easy number to factorize. It's not divisible by 2, 3, 4, 5, all of that. It's only factors other than itself and 1 are 19 and 23. So this is what the private key is. The private key that I have access to are the numbers 19 and 23. So we're now going to encode this message using this key. So what we do is we assign to each letter a number, and it goes in order. So A corresponds to 0, B corresponds to 1, C to 2, and so on, all the way down to Z, which corresponds to 25. So I'm going to give each letter in this message a number. So I would correspond to 8, L would correspond to 11, O to 14, and so on. So this is how I encode the message. I take these two numbers in the private key, and I'm going to write 19231923 from 19 and 23. So I'm going to write 1923, 19, 19, 23, I can stop there because I'm out of letters. So what I now do is I'm going to shift each letter by the number in blue. So what I do is add together these two numbers. So 8 plus 1 is 9, 11 plus 9 is 20, 14 plus 2 is 16, and so on for the rest of them. So now I have a whole new set of numbers. I turn each of these back to letters using the exact same correspondence here. All the zeros I turn to A, ones I turn to B, any twos I turn to C, and so on. So 9 corresponds to J, 20 to U, 16 to Q, and so on. But this number here is 27 whereas there are only 26 letters in the alphabet. They only go from 0 to 25. So if that happens, if you get a number that's too big, you just subtract 26 from that number. So 27 is going to be B, which is 1. So that letter there will be B, and then I keep on doing it for the rest of them. So now I have a message in green that is gibberish. If you just got this message in green and nothing else, you wouldn't know that it says, I love soccer. Okay, so if I received this message in green, how would I decode it and get back to I love soccer? Well, we do it one letter at a time. Let's start with J. So from this correspondence here, J corresponds to the number 9. Now, because I know the private key, I know that to get J, I shifted one letter up from I to J. So this time, instead of adding one, I subtract one to get 8, and 8 corresponds to I. I do the same for U. It's 20 in this correspondence. I know I shifted the letter nine spots up to get U, so I'm going to shift it nine spots back. I'm going to subtract nine from 20 to get 11, which gives me L. And I do the same for all of these letters when I got to, say, N here. 
it's 13. I know I shifted it nine spots up, so I'm going to shift it nine spots down by subtracting nine. 13 minus nine is four, which corresponds to eight. That's how I would decode the message in green. But the thing is, I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't know the private key. So if I looked at the first letter, for example, without the private key, I wouldn't have known that I had shifted the original letter one spot up to get J. So I wouldn't have been able to just shift it one spot back to get I. I need the private key to know how much each letter has been moved in order to decode the message. So that's the thing. Without the private key, you can't do this. So the public key of 437 is not an easy number to factorize. The reason it's not easy to factorize is because it's semi-prime. So think about it like this. If I made the public key, say, 440, which has a lot of factors, it's really easy to factorize 440. You could probably draw a prime factor tree in under a minute. But factorizing a large number, that's the product of two primes, is not easy to do. In reality, they would use public key, a semi-prime number that is hundreds of digits long. It's two massive, massive prime numbers multiplied together. Computers can't perform that factorization quickly, if at all. So if you didn't have the private key here, you'd have to factorize 437. Now you could do that because this is an oversimplification. In reality, yes, computers would never use a number as small as 437, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how it works. This is a very simplified version of what's called RSA cryptography. This method has many benefits. Among them, if you start with the same letter C, it gets shipped to different letters. It gets mapped to an F the first time and it got mapped to a D the second time. So it's harder for people to crack. All right. Thank you so much for tuning into this video. This has been the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Have a great day.